As somebody who writes a lot about King, I feel compelled to do a lot of speaking about it because it really has a lot to do with our public discourse. And uh, when you start writing about King, it sort of, in my mind anyway, uh, it necessarily comes right into the current um, discussions about various things. So at the end of this, I hope to you know, make that pretty clear with a few comments. Um, I was speaking this morning at um, Highline Community College, and they had a whole week of things there on King, and I noticed, um, I spoke today, yesterday it was Bill Ayers, um, in their newspaper from the students, it says, ex-radical Bill Ayers to speak at Highline. <laughs> and I was thinking, what a fate, you know, once you become a faculty member, you're an ex-radical. <laughs> so I've always tried to avoid that fate as much as possible. I've always thought that uh, there's not a lot of division between my personhood as an activist and my personhood as a scholar, and I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. Um, first, I want to thank the Harry Bridges Center for many years of support for what I've been doing. Uh, I was the Harry Bridges Chair for four years, which is two terms, and all of the people at the center are just great folks. and. Um, uh, Andrew has done wonderful things on publicizing and supporting the work I'm doing now, and Jim Gregory especially I'd like to thank. He's always been a very gracious person, and um, I feel like the history department here also has also been uh, wonderful to me, even though I'm in Tacoma and we don't have a history department there. <laughs> We're interdisciplinary, so-called, and I'm in ethnic, gender, and labor studies there. But anyway, I feel a real kinship with this campus and have done, taught a few courses here and really have always enjoyed it. Um, and the great folks at the International Longshore and Warehouse Union down at Tacoma, Local 23, uh, many people down there that I know and also Local 19 up here. So I feel like there are, I have a lot of debts here from 20 years of teaching at UWT. Um, I gave a bookstore talk the other night at the University Bookstore and somebody came up to me and this is how, what happens when you're connected to the Harry Bridges Center. She said, you know, my great-grandfather was a Pinkerton uh, a detective, and his job was to uh, shut up the labor movement. And so he went around, um, you know, gathering material. And it turns out he has a whole trunk full of uh, flyers and newspapers and things. And so she gave me this one little piece from there, them. It's an IWW flyer sometime between 1920 and 1925 when this guy was doing this. And the title is, Put the Boss in Overhauls. Have you ever tried to figure out why the many who work own nothing and the few who never work own everything? It's a big thought when you stop to consider, isn't it? Uh, and then it goes on uh, about working people and what they're suffering and so forth. And at the back, of course, it says, which side are you going to take? We want to put the idle profiteers in overalls and give them a chance to either work or starve like us. Join the IWW. And ever since I've been in the West, I, I know there's a different culture than what I grew up in, which was UAW, Auto Workers Land in Detroit. And my grandparents, who were, um, one worked in a shop as a foreman, but was in the union. He was an electro-stereotyper. Uh, my uncle, my mom's twin brother, was the union organizer for the um, uh, Communication Workers of America. Almost all of my cousins and everybody else were working class people. And uh, so, you know, I grew up in this kind of a um, uh, little bit Harriet and uh, Ozzy, Ozzy and Harriet sort of land um, of the 1950s. And um, what I want to do is three things, and I'll try to do it expeditiously. Um, one is I want to sort of raise the question of why we do what we do. Uh, and, you know, I gave a talk Wednesday in Tacoma called um, uh, My Journey Through King, which was really about how did I end up doing this kind of work. And so I want to just talk about that for a minute because I think it's important for people who are doing scholarship which is a huge amount of work, and it's really a life calling, uh, to see you know, that you don't have to divide your personal life and your political life from your work as an academic. 
And that's very important to me. And secondly, it's important because it, it has to do with how I understand King. Um, there's a conference coming up in April called Memory Versus Forgetting, Labor History and the Archive. And it's the Southern Labor Studies Association and the Labor and Working Class History Association. And that's kind of how I came up for the, with the title for today, uh, History and Memory, Revisiting King's Vision of Labor Rights and Economic Justice. And so for that, I've been thinking about, you know, th this thing about sources and where do we get the information that we get and how do we make something out of it. And um, in 1980, when I was trying to figure out what my dissertation topic was, these issues became very important uh, to me as to why I wanted to go in the direction that I ended up going in. And I wasn't, I didn't start out working on Martin Luther King. Um, but the general situation in 1980 was, was this, that in terms of labor studies, there was a big hole when it came to southern labor uh, organizing. Um, there was a lot of labor history done uh, at that point by various people. Uh, people who influenced me personally, kind of pushing me in the direction of doing it. Um, Mel Dubofsky, who was at Northern Illinois, where I went to graduate school, but also uh, Herbert Gutman. I just happened to meet him one time, and he really charged me up and told me that I was going in the right direction and I should go there. And David Montgomery, who was the editor for my first book. So I was fortunate to have contact with some really, uh, really fine labor historians. Um, but the situation then was that uh, if you looked at what happened in the South, the country, except for a few things that had been done by Ray Marshall, Secretary of Labor, um, under Jimmy Carter, uh, and, and an economist, not a historian, had done a lot on labor in the South. Um, and also the, George Tyndall in his book on the South, had, and also C. Van Woodward, had given these sort of broad sweeps of labor history. But you could have the sense that really not too much happened. And I'll tell you uh, in a minute why I thought nothing had happened, uh, but I found out different. And the other thing was that the way Martin Luther King was considered was mostly as, quote, a civil rights leader. I mean, this is the way people thought of King. Um, and, of course, I talked to James Lawson, who was one of King's right-hand men, so to speak, and he was the leader of the Memphis ministers and the Memphis sanitation strike. And he's really down on this phrase. He said, we never thought of ourselves as, quote, civil rights leaders. I mean, some people did. But King, no. Lawson, no. Uh, we were dealing with the whole range of issues. When we started the Nashville sit-in movement in 1960, he said, we charted out everything that was wrong in Nashville, and we started attacking them one by one. Employment discrimination was at the top of the list. Uh, discrimination in public accommodations was at the top of the list. Voting rights was at the top of the list. So the question was, where do we start? It wasn't, you know, that once we get these civil rights things, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 65, everything will be fine. He said, no, these were just the starting points. You know, that's where we chose to start because it was a standing insult every day to see those colored and white signs, and it was intolerable. We had to get rid of those. But that was not the beloved community that we had in mind. The beloved community was getting rid of war, racism, poverty across the board. We never limited it to civil rights. And you had a lot of the early writing about King would sort of lead you in that direction, and also the way we uh, people sort of still um, look at King, I think, is very much that way. Some people started making some great breakthroughs. Uh, David Garrow wrote this humongous uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book on King. Uh, but here's the thing, uh, there's no labor analysis, in fact, there's no analysis of any kind, almost, in the book. Uh, it's just telling you what happened. And as soon as Dr. King is killed in Memphis, that's the end of the story. So there's no explanation of what the Memphis movement was about. Um, similarly, uh, most of the other books, um, uh, Taylor Branch's wonderful three-volume book, uh, series on King uh, 
That's how his ends. When King is killed, book ends. End of story. Again, no analysis about labor and civil rights and how these issues fit together. Now, you wouldn't expect Taylor Branch to do that. He's more of a journalist and so forth. Um, Adam Fairclaw and a few other historians have done a much better job of doing that. But it sort of ended up my turn in the historiography to address the relationship of labor rights and civil rights in, in various ways. And <clears throat> so that's what I, I want to talk about. Um, first of all, I'm going to insert myself in the story. There we go. Okay. So we'll start with college, Mike, undergraduate, 1965, <clears throat> conscientious objector against the war in Vietnam. Like many people, I was following King it, throughout the 1960s. Everything he did, I was watching and following what he did. And one of the one of the things he said unmistakably is that if you're a, of draft age, um, refuse, say no. And so uh, I actually uh, registered as a conscientious objector when I first registered for the draft before I went to college. When I was drafted in 1969, they classified me as a CO. I married this lovely person in hippie land. Uh, we were having great times in college. Um, grew up in a very nice little town in Michigan. So not the kind of person you'd expect to end up being a civil rights radical in the South. And there's that word civil rights. It was much more than that. A movement organizer. That's what we always talked about in that period was the movement. We didn't qualify it as which kind of movement, just the movement. So, you know, SDS, there I am in the middle occupying a building. That was something that we often did in SDS on campus. But next thing I knew, I was down in Kentucky as a conscience objector working for a civil rights group, getting thrown in jail for writing a letter protesting six black people who were uh, arrested by the police in Louisville for protesting the murder of Dr. King. And they'd been in jail for two years uh, when I got down to Louisville. So I came down in the aftermath of Dr. King's death. Uh, of course, for writing a letter, then I was arrested and my wife was arrested and we ended up in this little jail in southern Kentucky, um, which is a whole story in itself. Uh, the inmates tried to burn the jail down while we were in it. Not very smart. Uh, we almost uh, all got fumigated to death there. Um, the organization I was in believed that you should never pay bail, so uh, for three weeks they had me in solitary confinement. Uh, the police wanted me out of there, so they pretended like there was a, a, a lynch mob coming to the jail. The guy shot off his gun in the backyard. All sorts of crazy things happened. And finally I said, look, get me out of here. And so fortunately they did. We worked with this group, Operation Freedom, giving um, uh, help to people in the Deep South, particularly uh, Fayette County, uh, Tennessee, where people were thrown out of their homes for registering to vote. And... Um, all of West Tennessee. Uh, so then we moved out of the frying pan and into the fire down to Memphis, and I spent six years as an organizer in Memphis. This is in front of the federal building. Um, Free Angela Davis is the sign, you can't quite read it. Uh, so 1970, that's what we were doing. We were organizing against political repression during the Nixon administration when John Mitchell the, the Attorney General had a concerted effort to destroy everybody in every movement, the women's movement, the peace movement, the radical New Left movement, the Black Panther Party, Angela Davis, you name it. Uh, so we were part of the counter fight, fight against that. When people think the Civil Rights Movement ended with Dr. King's assassination, it's totally erroneous. A lot more happened in the 70s, almost more in a way, but it was different. And so we worked on local police brutality cases um, and basically for six years I found out how difficult it really is to change anything in the South. Uh, moved to Washington, D.C. Um, Howard University fortunately gave me a scholarship and um, I tried to apply to law school and of course the first thing they said was, son, have you ever been arrested? And so that was the end of law school. Um, but Howard University, on my application, they said, yeah, I've been arrested, here's why, and they liked that, you know. 
So, so that's how I ended up there at Howard. Um, but what it did was it, that whole experience in the South positioned me in a certain way. And this uh, topic that we're going to talk about in April, uh, labor history in the archive, uh, I discovered I had my own archive, which was these experiences in the South, and that I looked at things really differently than other graduate students did and that even the professors did. The reason I didn't go to graduate school in the first place was because I felt the professors were never doing anything. They were just talking about doing things or not even doing that. And so I didn't want anything to do with the university at the beginning after my undergraduate. Um, but after six years of organizing, uh, my personal archive was, uh, how did it get like that? You know, how is the South, how did it end up like this? And where was the labor movement? You know, when I worked in Memphis, it looked, I mostly worked with the black community, as you could see in those pictures. Uh, and I made great friends, and one of the reasons I was able to do this book, Going Down Jericho Road, was because I knew almost all the characters in the story during the strike, because I met them afterwards, after that strike was over with. And, um, but I wondered where was, where was the white, you know, union people in Memphis, because there were plenty of them. Um, how could the police power be so unchallenged? When I was there in Memphis, I remember, you know, if a kid, a black kid would steal a coke off a truck, they'd shoot him in the back. I mean, this, that actually happened. Um, a kid named Elton Hayes stole a car, the police chased him down, 17 police converged on him and beat him to death. Uh, it was open season on black people in Memphis during that time. It was also open season on us. Every place we went, the police followed. I can remember very distinctly calling a friend, I'll meet you at the Firestone factory, we'll put out a leaflet, we get to the Firestone factory and the police are already there. So, you know, they were listening to our every, uh, everything that we say. And one of the pictures that we had a few slides ago um, one of the people is a Vietnam veteran against the war. He's up, he looks great. He's a southern guy, you know, and everything. Well, he was a police agent. So, you know, that's another reason they knew everything that we did. So when I went to uh, Howard University, my idea was that I, I wanted to understand how things got to be this way, but I also had this intimation in, or this sense of myself that things were different than we thought they were in the, what we were learning in the history books. Um, did all the poor whites support the Confederacy? That was my first project. And I wrote an article uh, called uh, White Unionists in the Confederacy about the working class, poor people, especially in the mountains, who joined the Heroes of America, underground um, opposition to the Confederate uh, government, uh, the draft resistors, the draft refusers. Of course, uh, then I worked with uh, Ira Berlin later on the Freedom History Project, and we were reading through the, the, the books that were used in the, out in the fields. They were full of blood and mud um, of, you know, the uprisings of the slaves uh, who refused to go along what W.E.B. Du Bois called the general strike of, of black labor during the South. And so I was really focusing on the Civil War and Reconstruction at the beginning, and then the rise of populism and the defeat of populism through racism, uh, the Wilmington Massacre of 1898, in which they systematically killed off the white populists, killed off the black Republicans, and removed the very last black congressman from Congress uh, in the South, in, in North Carolina. That was 1898. And then the imposition of segregation. So. Um, in, in the middle of all this, I met Pete Seeger, who influenced me a lot in terms of the music of the South. And, the, you know, if you can't find the protest uh, of working people in the history books, you can find it often in the music books or on the sound recordings. Uh, Pete's father did a whole series of recordings in 1937 with Southern people. One of them was John Hancock, so I'm working on a book about him from the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. So I started working music into this, and again, this was my own archive that I started with, because when I was in the South, we were always singing. You know, every mass meeting, we'd have songs. And um, I met some of the really great freedom singers of the time. Jim, you wouldn't know their names necessarily, but Jimmy Collier and Betty Mae Fikes, Guy Carawan, 
uh, Sparky Rucker. There's just a whole bunch of these people, and most of them are still alive. So this also influenced my direction of research. Uh, I started singing with David Sawyer there on the left. That's John um, Lewis in the middle from Congress from Georgia. And anyway, so my, my first uh, effort then what ended up as this book, Southern Labor and Black Civil Rights. And you'll notice the title. You know, it's trying to link these two uh, things. And again, it was about archives. I was in Washington, D.C., so I went through all the, the archives in the National Archive that I could find about Memphis. I found lots of amazing things that, that I never knew had happened. I don't think anybody knew until I started uh, doing this stuff. And when it came time, after about six years of research or more, it was finally published in 93. I started researching it in 1981. Um, Augie Meyer, who some of you will know who he is, you probably even know him, he said, you can't link Southern labor and black civil rights. The unions kept black people out. True, you know, many unions did. But I was trying to put together a different framework which had to do with the CIO and the industrial unions in the South when labor and civil rights were linked. But he, Augie was kind of a Cold War liberal and he wanted to see the unions either as communist and bad or as racist and bad. He wasn't really sympathetic to anything else. And so finally I had to get a different advisor for the series. They, they, he kept me out of the Black History series. Um, because he just didn't like the way I was doing this. Uh, and it's partly because the historiography was what he was talking about. It was Cold War historiography. And the movement of the left and people from the grassroots, uh, that history wasn't very strongly there. And uh, the Civil Rights Movement was seen as something by itself, the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't linked to the 1930s and 40s as much as it became later. And so the second part of my archive was not my own, not just my own personal memory, but going to organizers and talking to them about their experiences. And I started with white workers because they were the easiest ones to find. And um, their story was quite different. You know, uh, Ed McRae, and he was one of the best organizers probably in the South. His memory was that in the 1930s that white workers were mad as hell and that they didn't, in many cases, they were ready to organize with black workers, even in places you'd never imagine, like Ducktown, Tennessee, in the mines, um, in the zinc mines down there. And so he told me personal story after personal story, and other people did too, a guy named Red Davis, who organized the maritime workers in uh, the inland waterways. So what I started to gain from this was a different understanding of how you do history. And um, it led me to this <coughs> book, Black Workers Remember, which was all about you know, the labor movement from the inside as told by African Americans in their memory. And of course, um, you know, memory is not the same as history. Uh, memory is something that you build up over time and you cherish it and you elaborate it and it's your story. It's telling your story. So um, what I ended up calling this is the power of remembering uh, in this book. Um, it's not that everything they said, you know, could be meticulously shown to be exactly what happened. Although I was able to find that almost everything they told me was I could document almost everything that everybody told me. But the power of remembering was that they gave themselves power in the story. Um, when I first talked to white workers, uh, I'd say, well, can you put me on to some black workers who participated in this movement of the CIO? And they, they'd scratch their heads. They couldn't think of anybody. Most of the paid officers were white. Very few black paid officers in the CIO. Um, and so. I started finding these people and then one person led to another person led to another person and eventually uh, I was able to collect a, a very diverse story of different black workers from different industries and they all had great stories to tell. And um, what I found from this is that you know one of the biggest problems we have doing this kind of history 
uh, is our documentation is dying out. You know, most of the people that I interviewed then are now dead. Um, and without them, I could not have really told this story um, in any real way. Uh, most of the people in the legislatures at that time, most of the people in the news media were white, you know, and they weren't working class for the most part. And so the story that you get of Southern labor in that period is very distorted um, in that way. So I was learning a lot from this process of unlocking the archive of different sorts, both documentary in the National Archives, labor records, everything I could find. But secondly, the power of remembering. And ultimately, what I discovered was that this dull pain of not remembering hovers over not just the history of black workers or white workers, people at the bottom, it even hovers over Martin Luther King, which is how do we remember Martin Luther King or do we remember uh, a lot of the things that he did? And um, like a lot of people, I sort of thought of King in the speech, in, you know, in the suit and the tie, giving a speech at the uh, March on Washington. I knew about the Poor People's Campaign of 1968 because I went on the Poor People's Campaign after Dr. King was killed. But I was in the New Left, and like a lot of people in the New Left, I thought, well, the Black Panther Party was really it. You know, this is the really revolutionary organization. They were talking about socialism, the, you know, uh, self-defense, the Third World, International Revolution, fighting uh, with the Vietnamese instead of against them. And I kind of thought of King as somewhere a little back, like maybe as kind of a liberal at the time. So since then, I've totally revised my view of King, and a lot of other people have too. Um, one way I revised my view of King was this study of the Memphis sanitation strike and um, the way that he uh, was able to step into this situation. And let's see if I can get this DVD to work. This tells you something, and I'd like to play it if I can get it to go. Oh, freedom. Buried in my grave, but I will rise for my right to be free. If we are going to get equality, if we are going to get adequate wages, we are going to have to struggle for it. Now, you know what? You may have to escalate the struggle a bit. If they keep refusing and they will not recognize the union and will not agree uh, for the check off of the collection of dues, I'll tell you what you ought to do, and you're together here enough to do it. In a few days, you ought to get together and just have a general wet stoppage in the city of Memphis. You know we're standing for our unions and we shall not be moved. You know we're standing for our unions and know that we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not and that's why I say there ain't no harm to keep your mind stayed on freedom. There ain't no harm to keep your mind stayed on freedom. There ain't no harm to keep your mind. Your mind stayed. 
I gave a talk a couple years ago when Going Down Jericho Road came out, so I'm not going to go through the story line because a lot of you know it. Um, <clears throat> but what I'd like to pick up on for about an, an 10 minutes and then I'll finish is where this led in terms of opening up another archive. Um, this book was done with W.W. W. Norton and it got, you know, sort of commercial distribution. In terms of archives, I had discovered in 1992 when I was doing research at the King Center in Atlanta where the King Paper, some parts of the King Papers are and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference Papers are. This file, it said, King's Labor Speeches. And I said, what? King's Labor Speeches? And I started going through them. And um, after that, I kept looking for more speeches. And uh, what I found sort of surprised the heck out of me, really. Uh, and I, that's what I want to talk about f for the last few minutes here, is that um, our conception of King as civil rights leader is really shallow. Uh, what I found was that King had a very strong relationship to labor unions, uh, and he always had that relationship um, to labor unions. Uh, it starts with a speech at Highlander Folk School in 1957. And he goes from there, and the, the book is divided into three parts. Um, uh, what I was going to say about the King family was that I had found these speeches and I was talking to various publishers about, hey, there's this great set of speeches by King. Um, that are un totally unknown uh, you know, to the public and even to historians. And they really should be in a book. <clears throat> Finally, after Jericho Road came out, they contacted me and they had decided that they were going to republish all of King's early writings, which were with Beacon Press, the Unitarian Service Committee. And that's, I'm a Unitarian. I started out with the Unitarian Service Committee as a CO. And so Beacon Press contacted me and said, they want you to do this book. And of course, I had all the materials. So, but they wanted it like right now. And uh, it's part of a King Legacy series that uh, has just started. So I did this book in a year, which is, I've never done any book <laughs> in a year before. Um, but of course, it's King's speeches, not mine. I mean, it's basically what we had to do was verify these speeches find where he gave them, give some detail about them. And then a lot of work, we found out, went into comparing the written speech with the audio speech when we could find it. And they were often very different. So these speeches have had a lot of work done on them to make them the most up-to-date, accurate speech that we can come up with. And um, in terms of, I think, what it does for our understanding of King is it finally puts it sort of over the line that people finally have to recognize that labor was a part of the civil rights movement and labor was always part of King's agenda. And it wasn't just because of the Memphis sanitation strike, which was kind of happenstance in a way, you know, he was organizing his poor people's campaign this strike began of sanitation workers in the middle of the winter, which is not the time to have a strike. If you're in sanitation, you should do it in the summer um, when the garbage piles up and gets unbearable. And of course, they're going to settle. But they did it in February because the conditions were so horrendous. And two men died in the back of a sanitation truck when it malfunctioned and crushed them to death. And then they also had a series of events where uh, they got rained out of work and the whites got to stay at work and get full-time pay and the blacks got sent home with no pay. 40% of the workers in this industry in Memphis were on welfare. I mean, they worked 60-hour weeks, but they were on welfare. That's how poor the pay was. And so um, where, where the book Lee, uh, ends up is in Memphis. Um, that little snippet of the speech you heard, um, 
is in a speech in the back of the book, there's two speeches that you can hear on audio, because listening to King and reading are two different experiences, for sure. Uh, but the remarkable thing about that speech to me, uh, it's given on March 18th, 1968, totally an unknown speech. The whole speech is in here now, and it's also the whole recording is in here. This was not King going in and somebody writing a speech for him. Some of the speeches in here were written for him by other people, and he revised them. I mean, he always gave his own twist to whatever he did. But his speech to the AFL-CIO in 1961 was written by Stanley Levinson, who was a former communist, or maybe was a former communist. We don't even know that for sure. But he was the one that John F. Kennedy told King in the Rose Garden, you've got to get rid of this guy, along with Jack O'Dell, who a lot of you know about Jack O'Dell because he's been here. Um, and what it did was it set uh, FBI Director Hoover off on a total uh, crazed attempt to destroy King. When, I mean, he, was, he already believed King was a communist. I mean, imagine the most famous Baptist preacher in the world, and this head of the FBI thinks he's a, a communist, uh, which King explained many times why he didn't agree with communism. Uh, and, but anyway, some of his speeches were sort of ghost-written, like that one. But the speech in Memphis was King flying in from Los Angeles via Mississippi, uh, coming into a, a mass meeting of 15,000 people, the biggest mass meeting that was held throughout the whole civil rights era in the South, because it was in the uh, Church of God in Christ Temple in Memphis. Was the, you know, there was no place that big anywhere in the South where black people could go. Uh, they couldn't go to the public stadiums, they weren't allowed, and so forth. So he walks into this mass meeting, and people are really frustrated. The strike's been going on for six weeks, and you know it looks like they're going to lose, probably. And um, he senses the mood of the thing. And if you read this, the speech, you'll see, I mean, he, he immediately starts ticking off all of the grievances of black working class people, unemployment, low wages, he said it's a crime for people to live in this rich nation and get starvation wages. Most people who uh, are poor people, do you know that they work hard every day? They just don't get paid. Uh, what makes labor um, undignified is not what the labor is. You know, uh, being a sanitation worker is important work. If the sanitation worker doesn't do his work, then disease spreads, and it's just as important as the doctor. What makes it undignified is rotten, rotten wages and no rights. And so he stands up you know, very clearly for labor rights and union rights. And as you're thinking about this after you've read all the other speeches, you realize King really is a labor man. I mean, he really knows exactly what he's talking about. He's, nobody has to prime him <laughs> and tell him what to say. It just pours right out of him. And, uh, you know, then you think about it. Well, King was born at the onset of the Great Depression in 1929. He saw people in his church standing in bread lines. He worked in the fields in high school, saw poor blacks and whites in the tobacco fields and what that was like. Uh, and so uh, this title, All Labor Has Dignity, is pulled from that speech. And he gives a wonderful, um, just a sort of overview. And the very last speech in the book, is the night before he's killed, going down Jericho Road uh, speech, uh, and the next day he's, he's killed. That's also a labor speech to a labor audience. And, um, but if, if you remember from the little DVD, when he says, you ought to just get together and have a general work stoppage, um, the, the recording sort of cuts it off, but actually what happens is in the recording, the, the full recording, People are screaming and yelling for about five minutes. You know, people are saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are jumping up and down, and you know, the whole place is going crazy. Because they know what he knows, which is that 80% of the work, the real hard work in Memphis, is done by black people. You know, they do all the unskilled labor almost. They work for even, you know, even working class white people could afford to pay a black woman to do their domestic work because they paid her three to five dollars a week. And so his you know, call was, we should just all quit work, everybody, including the students, and we would bring the city to a halt. 
And he was fixing to do that. He was going to come back to Memphis to do that. Uh, and a freak snowstorm sort of stopped it from happening. And when he did come back, the FBI and the police had sort of instigated uh, window smashing, and the police moved in. It turned into a riot. Then King had to come back once again to prove that he could leave it, lead a nonviolent march because this was jeopardizing the poor people's campaign in Washington. And then he was killed. So everything, you know, took the wrong turn. But if you think about the civil rights era ending with a mass general strike of black workers in Memphis, uh, and an interesting thing, the only place I've ever seen this, the white ministers and the white labor people supported the strike. Not all white ministers, but a significant number. And the AFL-CIO fully backed this strike. You, I don't know of any other instance in the South where this happened. You could call it a civil rights strike. The I am a man slogan was, you know, that this isn't just about unions and this job, it's about dignity and human rights. And King brought that fully out in his uh, speech. And so anyway, um, just to, to wrap it up, uh, there's a lot of material in here that speaks to our present. Um, it's about the attacks on public employees today, public employee unions. Uh, this strike of 68 opened the way for AFSCME to organize the public sector for the next 30 years, become the biggest union in the country. Um, it uh, provided a stepping stone for teachers, firemen, other people. Interestingly enough, after this Memphis sanitation strike, who went on strike? The white police officers, the white teachers, and the white firemen, and they all won their strikes. You know, and they were afraid to do it before the black workers went on strike. Um, so it also has to do with the politics of class and race today, because King, it turns out, you know, it's very convincing. King did not just make a turn toward the left after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and from 65 to 68. He became more radical, which is the way I always thought it was. But through the King documents that we've been finding in the Martin Luther King papers at Stanford, uh, we find in 1952 he's writing a letter to Coretta King, his future wife. He's reading Edward Bellamy. Uh, look, what's that socialist utopian novel, Looking Backward, I think? Uh, where, you know, profiteering is done away with and everybody has equality and so forth. And he's saying, you know, uh, capitalism has outlived its day and I'm waiting for, you know, a better kind of system to take place. Um, and the first speech in the book, and I'll finish with that. He's at Highlander Center in Tennessee. This is where Rosa Parks went a few weeks before she decided not to get up <laughs> from her seat on the bus. Um, Highlander Center was the place that was organized in 1932 in support of the CIO. And it was the CIO school up until 1949 when the CIO kicked out its left-wing unions, 11 of them with a million members. And the Cold War took out a whole bunch of civil rights and left-wing union people, about a million of them, from the CIO. And they took out Highlander as well because Highlander refused to uh, prohibit people from coming there because they were alleged to be communist. They said, look, we've been fighting that the whole time, you know. I mean, that's always been the charge against the labor movement. So um, it was a tragic turn within the labor movement and the civil rights movement sort of suddenly emerged out of that. And so a year after the Montgomery bus boycott and its success, he's speaking at Highlander. And this is where the picture of King sitting in the meeting uh, and the headline underneath, King at a communist training school, comes from. They put it on the billboards. The John Birch Society sent it on posters. I've got one of those postcards. He wasn't at a communist training school. He was at Highlander, you know, which was a, not that at all. So he says, um, I'll just finish with this. Uh, he's talking about the social psychology and child psychology language of that time in the 1950s about people being maladjusted and how you should become adjusted, children should become adjusted. But there are some things in our social system to which I am proud to be maladjusted and to which I suggest that you too ought to be maladjusted. I never intend to adjust myself to the viciousness of mob rule, 
I never intend to adjust myself to the evils of segregation and the crippling effects of discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to the tragic inequalities of an economic system which takes necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. Sounds kind of like today. 1% own more wealth than 90% of the rest of us combined. I never intend to become adjusted to the madness of militarism. He didn't just turn against the Vietnam War in 1967. This is 1957. Uh, and the self-defeating method of physical violence. So I call upon you to be maladjusted. Well, you see, it may be that the salvation of the world lies in the hands of the maladjusted. So that's my story. Thank you. Well, it was always going in both directions at once, you know, even in the CIO, which all the CIO unions had a dis an anti-discrimination clause in their constitution. And they, a lot of them had anti-discrimination clauses in their contracts. So like the packing house workers, here's an example of the good, good CIO union. Packing house workers union had been defeated through racial division in Chicago and other places during and after World War I. They'd been defeated before that by playing Slovaks up against Poles. And you know they'd, the, the Packers had always used divisions. And so when they formed in 1935 as the Packing House Workers Organizing Committee, their very first principle was interracial organization. Because they said, if we don't have that, we'll never have a union. And that was the principle on which they built the whole thing. And um, so the Packing House Workers, the black workers on the killing floor, definitely had a place in the union. And so that union thrived. And, Actually, the packing house workers gave more money to the um, Montgomery bus boycott than any other organization in the country. And they gave more than half of the money uh, that supported the Montgomery bus boycott. And it's because they had black leadership in the union and white leadership committed to civil rights. Um, now, a lot of the other unions in the CIO were not like that. They had these clauses uh, and they had these principles in their constitutions, but in the South, they didn't follow it. So the United Auto Workers Union, for instance, had that principle, but down South, uh, Miles Horton at Highlander told me, you know, the UAW organizers in the South were like the Klan. I mean, they were, they were just white supremacy all the way. And so there was this war going on inside the unions in the CIO, in, in some of them, like that. And <clears throat> the AFL unions, as you well know, uh, most of them were segregated completely. And some of them, like the Railroad Brotherhoods, uh, excluded blacks completely. So one of the really neat speeches in here is 1961 to the AFL-CIO, where A. Philip Randolph has been protesting this to the AFL-CIO for years. And here they are, mostly white men, union officials, meeting in Miami, you know, in luxury hotels. And A. Philip Randolph is saying, you know, if you can throw out communist-led unions because they're communist-led, even though they're the strongest civil rights unions in, the most, in most cases, why don't you throw out these white supremacy unions? And they say, well, union autom autonomy. You know, you can't do that. Union autonomy. Union autonomy didn't mean anything in the Red Scare. You know, um, all of those unions that get, got kicked out had democratically elected leaders, but they got kicked out anyway. So, Randolph was under tremendous attack. They brought King in to, to give a speech because he was so famous. And what does he do? But he walks in and he says, and you know, he gives a nice speech about why labor and civil rights should be together and we're organizing together. But then he stops and he says, but you know what? It's, it's ludicrous for an organization like this to attack one of its strongest black leaders for saying the obvious, you know, and that you should do something about this. And he's never invited back again <laughs> to the AFL-CIO. And later on, he gives speeches in the book to the Packing House Workers National Convention, the District uh, 65 in New York City, 1199. In all these speeches, he said, you know, it's really hard to criticize your friends. And he was really uncomfortable doing this. But he's really happy to be among these civil rights unions where he doesn't have that pressure, where he feels like they're really with him. So in those meetings, you know, he talks about war, he talks about military, he talks about everything, 
He's totally comfortable with those unions. So that's, you know, it was a real mixed situation. And one of the more interesting documents is Labor Against the War, which is organized in 1967 by these very unions. ILWU is one of the leaders of this Labor Against the War. Harry Bridges was always against the war. He always spoke against the war. He always spoke against racism. He organized boycotts on the West Coast on King's behalf, um, supporting him in Alabama and so forth. And um, so they asked King to be the, boy, the, um, the keynote speaker for their rally. Uh, and he says, you know, one, we have a tremendous anti-war movement in 1967. The students, the churches, the black community, the civil rights organizations, uh, even working class whites are opposing the war. But one voice is missing, he said, it's the voice of labor. And, and this was the big schism. Uh, AFL-CIO was totally supporting the Vietnam War. And just last thing here is that King was trying to build a coalition through the Poor People's Campaign to get everybody going in the same direction. And the thing that was really screwing it up was the war in Vietnam, among other things. And secondly, this failure of a lot of the unions to really clean house and, and really you know, deal with discrimination. Well, I, I try to treat it as memory. You know, that the way people remember things is very important. Um, there's um, an Italian uh, oral historian, Alessandro Portelli, who talks a lot about this, that um, the way people remember things, even when they're erroneous, can tell you a lot about the way they think. And, um, and that's the case, you know, in many, many of the white workers that I talk to, we're extremely proud of their integrationist activities that they did. And yet I know from what I read, you know, that it was very much half-stepping most of the time. But in retrospect, they were really glad that they had done it. Um, and with the black workers, they were, one guy refused to talk to me because um, he was so angry about racism in the union and a white worker had told me to talk to him, and he said, well, why did he tell you to talk to me, you know? And just the fact that this guy had referred me, that was the end of that. Um, but the black workers also, at the end of interviews, almost always uh, made a very, very strong statement in favor of the labor movement and unions, even though they went through chapter and verse of all the terrible things like George Holloway, somebody tried to kill him at work. Clarence Coe, somebody tried to kill him at home. When they broke into these professions, you know, more skilled jobs, people called them names and did all the things you would, I mean, they went through hell. It was like a civil war. But at the end, they were totally pro-union because they said, without that, we never would have broke any of this down. So, you know, it's an interpretive issue. You can't just take one part of what somebody says and take that as the whole story. And try to look at the whole story. But, but it's very important, you know, because it tells you how people value something and why they would put their lives on the line, even though they're being discriminated against. Like George Holloway put his life on the line repeatedly for the labor movement, even though, you know, in bargaining sessions, they would call him the N-word. He had to sit at the end of the table by himself. He had to go up the elevator separately, he had to take the service elevator. I mean, he was treated terribly. But he was representing all the workers in the plant, including the white workers. So, um, you know, how come he did that? And, and his oral history tells you that. And otherwise, I wouldn't really understand, I don't think. Well, you know, it's a, it's a really wonderful story and a tragic story, too, because in Black Workers Remember, the last chapter is on deindustrialization. And um, what they tell you about is that after King's death, the public employee union became the strongest union in the state of Tennessee uh, in Memphis and helped to elect progressive mayors. And, um, but because of the right to work law in Tennessee, they were stopped from spreading into the hospital industry and into other service industries. And so they had this sanitation union, but even they became weak because they couldn't make people pay dues. The right to work law is that you can't make somebody 
belong to a union by, by taking a job in a place. And this is what they're trying to spread all over the country now, the Republicans. This is their next agenda. And if you can't get your dues from your members, you're going to die as a union. And that's what's happened to that union. It's, it's still there. It's still pretty strong. But, it's, but it's, it's, the weakness is that it's a right to work state and they can't require union membership. So, you know, a lot of people take it for granted and they say, well, why should I pay the dues? I'm getting the benefits anyway. The free riders syndrome that the labor movement talks about. And the Republicans are saying, like, this is great. This is your freedom of choice, you know, but really what it is, it's the death knell for unions. And so a bunch of different unions have gone down in Memphis. And then the second thing is deindustrialization, you know, offshoring and moving these jobs to Mexico. And that's just gutted all of the industrial unions of the CIO. So there's really not much left, you know, in Memphis. Um, and it's very sad. And what it's done is what William Julius Wilson talked about in that book um, about work. What was it called? When Work Disappears. When Work Disappears, that book, about how Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, you know, right on down the line, the middle class of the black community has been eviscerated by deindustrialization. And that's the case in Memphis. The, the good paying jobs were the unionized jobs. It wasn't necessarily, I mean, those unionized workers at Firestone did better than a middle, so-called middle class, you know, white collar worker would do. Um, but they lost them all. And Clarence Coe in the book said, you know, just about the time we finally got everything equal in all the plants, they started closing them down. So, you know, it's a very tragic story in a way. And, and there are zip codes in Memphis where 80% of the families are in poverty. Most of the families are headed by a single person. Um, it's all about that fallout from the loss of unionized jobs, which they once had, you know, in that city. So, you know, the political appeal of this is that's what we got to get back. It, it may not be industrial jobs, but uh, I had, had an article in the Seattle Times on Tuesday, and basically it was a call, fight for unions. You know, if you're for the middle class, if you're for health care, if you're for education, if you're for transportation, if you're for, you know, a decent ecology, if you don't have unions, the right wing rises and everybody else falls. And that's what's happening to us. Okay.